play. Well, hello there and welcome to Talking Tennis. Um, and I'm it's very absolute pleasure to be presenting live a live episode of our uh, WTA Matches of 2023 series. Um, whilst uh, sort of uh, whilst we are uh, counting down and remembering what has been a very good year for tennis, particularly women's tennis, and I'm it's my absolute pleasure to be joined by a very special guest. It's Andre Rollenberg for the Tennis and Bagels podcast. Andre, how are you doing? I'm doing okay. i am uh, got my special uh, red brick background just for this occasion. <laughs> <laughs> Ready to be ground into clay for the 2024 run on Garros yeah. and the Olympics. Grind is the right word here. <laughs> <laughs> for clay, yes. Yeah. Um, and it is very appropriate to be talking about clay um, and Roland Garros because that is where the number three match uh, of this list took place. Um, Obviously, we we've seen a few others. I don't know, Andre. Have you been following the series, seeing what's uh, what the other matches have been? I'm very sorry. I've just been kind of out of Twitter for a while, just because okay. of end of year and off season. Kind of got me a little just tired and just realizing just how much tennis there is. But I'm excited <laughs> to be sort of like easing it back into it. And uh, yeah, still no less excited to be here. <laughs> so. Brilliant, brilliant. Well, as a recap, um, I won't spoil what number one, numbers two and one are of our WTA series, but you'll have to um, catch those. But uh, yeah, number seven was um, Iga Svantec against Caroline Garcia in uh, Beijing. Uh, number six was Victoria Azarenka against Alina Svitolina in Wimbledon. Uh, number five was Anja Burr and Arena Sabalenka at Wimbledon. Uh, number four was... Carolina Mukova and Arena Sabalenka at Roland Garros. And the number three match is the match that followed that semi final. Yeah. Iga Svantec versus Carolina Mukova in the Roland Garros final. Um, which, I mean, look, if you don't know the results, you're probably very, very new to tennis, but slight spoilers if you didn't know. Um, this is probably the match that many Iga Svantec fans, in fact, most Iga Svantec fans, according to Twitter and polls I've seen in their fandom, um, would regard as their match of the year um, in many ways. Um, and I don't blame them. It was a little bit of a a roller coaster, is sort of how I broadly remember it. Um, is mm -hmm. that your memory as well, Andre? Yeah, I did. I did remember a few of it. Like I thought, I remember watching it and thinking, well, Iga Svantec seems like she's going to roll with it. Um, Always kind of like that in the back of my mind. Well, who knows? Maybe Mukova is going to come up with something. But um, yeah, it just had a lot of twists and turns, especially second set and forward and up until the end of it. Yeah, I mean, those two um, had a little bit of a rivalry. Well, not much really. They played once and Mukova had won, but that was proto Sviantec. That was 18 year old Sviantec who hadn't fully. Um, emerged um, yet, mm -hmm. but um, uh, we we kind of thought maybe you know Mukova could pull up a bit of a barty in that you know she had the tools to abolish contact with the variety that she had. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about the routes these two took to the final. We talked to obviously those of you who would have watched the episode yesterday would have heard about um, Mukova's route and um, mm -hmm. obviously beating Sabalenka in the semi final, saving match points. Um, Vunch and Miles predicted that um, Mukova would reach the semi-final. She had that really tough opening round against Zachary, which most insider tennis fans kind of saw that as an, quote, upset in terms of ranking, even though in terms of calibre, they're very evenly matched. I mean, they're both top 10 players ranked currently as it is. Um, and if yeah. I'm not mistaken, Mukova had beaten Zachary last year in the same round, right? Uh, oh, did she? <clears throat> Because Sakari reached 2021 semis, losing to um, Krejcikova. And then I think the next year, she lost to Mukova, first round. And then she drove her again, the same <laughs> the same player. I'm going to have to look I'm... this up now, because um, I I don't remember this. Um, I'm sure it was someone else that she beat, but uh, mm -hmm. let's have a look. Maria Sakari, Roland Garros 2022. Well, she lost in the second round of 22. Okay. Um, so it wasn't quite the same, but could still have been the same. Yeah, it was. It was Mukova. 
It was Mukova who beat her, right? Two time breaks, yeah. So actually, yeah. yeah. Mukova's beaten Sakari in two consecutive years at Roland Garros, which given Sakari's record as a... Maybe someone who came very, very close to winning it in 2021. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's face it, she had match point in that semi-final. She probably would have been the fresher player, player in that final against Pavlyuchenkova. There was a good chance she could have won Roland Garros that year. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, but that's tangent. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Tangent, ifs, buts, and maybes. The point is, Carolina Mukova, uh, Sakari has a Mukova problem at uh, Roland Garros. Um, yeah, Mukova kind of battled her way to um, the uh, semi final. I think it was a battle, but yeah. Um, I think once she got through Sakari, there were a she lot was of people basically, unconcluded yeah. she, who were backing her to get that far. Yeah, exactly. She sort of became, she sort of like, uh, you know, just clothe herself with the seating at that point because the, she was really the best player in that in that in that section, pretty much. So, oh yeah, she really, really was. Um, just having a look at what she had. Yeah, so like, um, she, yeah, so she obviously we we talked about. I'm, I'm gonna not say the names again. But yeah, she then beat 2020 semifinals Podoroska. She beat Begu. She beat um up and coming young talent Avanesian, who obviously John interviewed in Berlin. Um, she then beat Pavel um in the quarters, and then had that absolute roller coaster with Sabalenka in the uh, the semi final. Um, yeah, uh, obviously we've probably had some people's thoughts on that match, but um, what were your memories of that incredible the, comeback? Olaf, the semi final. The semi finals. Yeah. Uh, I didn't get to watch that match in particular, but I do remember that it was unreal. Like as in both Mukova's comeback and Sabalenka's, you know, <laughs> um, unfortunate uh, situation at this in this third set, just as in, I don't want to say she choked uh, because I just don't really like this, this word in general, but it's not a match that she should have lost. And the fact that she had, I think she had like three match points on serve, at like a 5-1 or something like that. But just to, to come back from that and just kind of crumble down to losing the semifinal, it was insane to me. And... Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I really like live. I really like Mukova's style of play. Uh, I think I thought she, it was going to be a really good um, final um, against Piantek, so I was really happy. And um, yeah, I mean, in terms of my thoughts on, on the Sabalenka Mukova match, I, I mean, there's just a lot to unpack <laughs> in that one. Yeah. That one, <laughs> which we had a whole episode on, so we don't exactly. have to do that. Uh, but you know, this is us plugging it. Like it's on the it's on the channel. Go back and watch it if you are watching along with us. By the way, hi. Feel free to get in the chat on this one because we are live, so we are going to be responding to you. Um, this is not like other premieres that we've had. I mean, obviously, you can get in the live chat of those, but we can actually address your comments on this. So, yeah, share your memories of um, uh, this French Open final. Um, I will say, though, if you are watching this back and it's not live, apologies. It's not going to be dealt with in the same way, but I'm sure our wonderful admin will Um uh, still come back on your comments uh and obviously we've still got a couple more episodes to come as well as our finishing the atp series as well but yeah thanks everyone for joining who is on um and with us on uh cross on uh, x and youtube facebook and twitch um shviontek's route didn't drop a set on the way to the final kind of expected from Iga shviontek at roland garros um she didn't really have the same kind of scare that maybe uh, Jean Chin Wen gave her in 2022. Um, but she, I, I think I, I'm not going to say that she wasn't tested either. Um, Coco Goff in the quarterfinals, yeah, it was a four and two win for Sviantec, but we started seeing signs from Goff of the version of Goff that would eventually go on to beat her in Cincinnati, take a set, uh, come very close to take a set off her at the WTA finals. Um, and then Beatrice had admire. Shviontek just scraped that second set in that tie break. And that semi-final was actually pretty good. It's it, it didn't go to a decider, so it wasn't going to make the top 10 end of year list. But I remember that second set tie break being an absolute nail biter. And had admire did and it was was a little unfortunate not to take it to a decider, as mm -hmm. she had been with so many other matches in the draw, if I remember right. Yeah, she just kind of pulled a bit of a uh, a marathon woman and that one just she played a few i think she beat jabber as well like in, in that in that in that draw yeah she did correctly 
Yeah, yeah and so that was like, yeah. She basically stole admired, their match as well. <laughs> before before the Sviantec match, had admired beaten had gone three sets in almost every match except her first one. She beat Diana Schneider in three, Alexandra in three, Sarubes Tormo in an almost four hour epic. Yeah, that one. Then I remember. Comes back to beat Jabur. I remember that was a proper comeback win. And then, yeah, almost tries to come back against Eager. And Eager just yeah. fends her off in a 9 7 and a second set tie break. Yeah. Um, obviously, you having a Brazilian background, that was probably mm. fun to watch for you. It was. I was. I was really hoping. I was really hoping that uh, that would like take at least the third set. Like once it gets to that point, I'm kind of game to whatever happens, uh, because I'm also I'm a fan of Igas as well. I think she's a great uh, ambassador for the sport. Uh, and in a sense, being number one coming off of a ridiculous season in 2022, I was thinking, well, maybe if there is a Grand Slam that um, Iga wants to win, it's it's this one. And not winning Rolling Arrows could have could have been tough i think for for her this year and i'm not sure like how how she would have bounced um back from like losing that one uh slam um she would have probably done all right um but maybe the season would have been the same but at the same time for Adaj Maya, i think was a um kind of like a personal preference like and just in the sense of my my background um and yeah, yeah i think i just think she, she liked maybe the sting that Sviantec has like in, in just like the confidence to go for that shot like when you really matter uh I remember she I think she served for the set at least like once or twice um she could have taken it she's tall she has a lefty serve um which kind of works well against Iga Sviantec on the ad side because she kind of gets to avoid the the forehand but it didn't it didn't work that way so maybe she was a bit fatigued I'm not super sure about that just because of a how she handled Jabur match after playing Soribis Tormo. But, you know, that's a, a discussion for maybe another story. I think yeah. Shiontek just had that extra, you know, number one is to her. <laughs> yeah, she had something extra, and that was very clear in that second set. And even if it had gone to the side, at, like how much in the tank did Haddad Maya really have? Mm -hmm. um, so, um, but, yeah, but I, I like the point you made earlier about um, Shiontek and yeah, there was a sense that she really, really needed this. I mean, there is now an assumption that she's going to win the French Open every time mm -hmm. uh, she enters the draw. She's the hot favourite. She hadn't won a title above 500 up to that point um, in 2023. Um, her clay season trophies, she'd won Stuttgart. She'd come very close to winning Madrid. Just some brilliance from Sabalenka, fended her off in the end. Rome, she re retired against Rabakina. I honestly think she would have won the title if she'd plowed on but maybe that wasn't mm -hmm. the best for her recovery in time for Roland Garros um and yeah she she kind of she, she there was this there was a definite sense that certainly from my sense as someone who enjoys watching Sviantec and, and and watching her play that she really needed this Roland Garros and I think maybe that's how it affected her a little bit during this final um I'm not going to say it was all on her and we'll get into mm -hmm. that when we properly break down the match. But I think that was a definite element to what made this final so nail biting. Yeah, for sure. Well, let's get into it. So mm -hmm. I said the final was a nail biter for the first set and a half. It really wasn't <laughs> six two. Exactly. Like, Iga Sviantek won the first set six two. She had break points against her at three one in the opening set, fended them off broke very early in the second set so she was leading six two three love um and there was just a sense that yeah it was Iga Sviantek in a grand slam final untouchable in the on the biggest stage um yeah and I think I remember when I, I commented on this match with John um and he was very I remember him saying uh very much that he he felt it was kind of inevitable by sort of midway through the set but any particular memories of um like how you how you sort of saw things going during the first set and a half up to about six two three love i mean i thought that Triantec had just like just the mental um just the mental fortitude and just like she was just in the headspace to win that match it didn't it didn't look like it was a contest like it looked like um mukova was just a bit um you know timid 
not really playing her best. She was choosing some really poor moments to go up the net where she has actually is really strong. But against Friantec, on clay, you kind of have to be more strategic about that. Um, and I just remember basically thinking the same. Like once Friantec hit three love, I just kept watching, obviously, because I didn't want to just like quit the match. But at the same time, I was just like kind of like, you know, looking, oh, my day is going to finish a bit earlier today, like in a sense, just because I felt like the match was over. Um, I wasn't really ruling out like a like a comeback in terms of like maybe Mukova breaks back, takes one of the breaks back. But I didn't think it was going to last. I think it was going to be about like a 6 2 6 4 tops. Um, and what unfolded, I don't know if it was much. I mean, obviously, I think that Mukova started playing better, but I do think that Shiontek maybe just fell off a bit. Like she maybe just kind of got caught off guard and just like, whoa, like what, what is going on? And then maybe the thoughts of like actually winning the slam, the Grand Slam again, like kind of got to her head and things just turned around. I mean, it's not uncommon for Shiontek during a match to have a, a service game lapse. It, and to be honest, mm-hmm. pretty much every tennis player I've watched has a service game lapse most matches. Um, even untouchable players on the ATP side like Djokovic and Nadal and Federer, um, even Serena Williams um, back in her day on the WTA side, um, you know, they, they would have the occasional service game where something would go off. And I think that's what happened with Sviantec was 3-1 up serving. Mm-hmm. Um, and because Mukova had held and that was giving her a little bit of confidence. But having said that, I think you're right. Mukova did set things up because the way she broke she she hit a winner. She she was playing aggressive, and suddenly, from that moment on, I think things were clicking. Um, and so for the remainder of the match, up until the very for the remainder of it, like the rallies were very much playing out of. Sviantek was trying to wasn't backing down, um, but both players were able to play aggressive. But more importantly, the look of a defense vastly improved, and she was able to mm-hmm. soak up what Sviantek was throwing at her and turn defense into attack. Um, and that's kind of where uh, we ended up with um, with that. I mean, like, let's let's stick to the second set for, for now in terms of narrative, but is that kind of along the lines of what you saw as well? Yeah, no, exactly. I felt like uh, Mukova's level improved drastically in that second set. Like, I think, especially, like, the way that she was serving volleying, like, that's one of the things that, for me, like, always catches my eye because it's something that doesn't necessarily happen often. And not to say that she just did it at every point, but she was doing it quite often. Uh, I think it was a good strategy to, to, against Fiontek in this sense, just, like, kind of, like, taking her off guard, not necessarily let, letting her um, lead from the back of the court, um, but also necessarily not overdoing it. Like, she did it in the first set and just kind of, like, set herself to failure just because... You know, if you do that too much, you're obviously gonna get past. Like it's 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 still a clay court, still you on tech. Um, she's still like sliding on the backhand or the open stance or the uh, the down the line backhand. It's it's something that is going to happen, and it kept happening for sure. But uh, Mukova played several points that were really good as well. Like in that regard, defended her serve really really well as well. I think she started like using her this slice and just kind of like she just kind of got into a place that she settled in the match, and that kind of ended up you know, giving her the ability to do it. Obviously, like, I think that in great part uh, for the second set, um, it was not necessarily so much. As I said, like, I, I felt like Shinotek maybe had the laps, but I thought that she, she, I thought she was going to break again. But I think that Mukova's uh, level might have surprised her a little bit, also because it didn't drop. It just kept going. Like, she just kept going for the entire set, playing at an insanely high level like that's that's one of the things that i've noticed in that second set i was like man that's that's a final like now now we got it now we're watching that final and um for you know like it even lasted like just kind of skip ahead just a little bit lasted for a little for for quite a bit in the in the third set still but things balanced out a bit (laughs) yes i i don't i don't think they were that unbalanced in the second set i think no when they got back onto break parity like Mukov mm. had a bit of a momentum boost um but uh, Iga didn't back down like Sviantek didn't mm. back down it, like she was she probably got a little bit flustered she was making errors but like she she didn't kind of go into herself or anything like that she didn't let Mukova come at her she was willing to take the fight um a bit like um Katrina was saying like Iga rose to the challenge and you know mm. uh I, I agree with you what you're saying. Like Mukova was 
I think Makeover was finally making a strategy work. Um, mm. But the second, the end of the second set, absolute nail biter because suddenly True. both of them get tight. Mukova served for the set twice. She served at 5 4, eager broke her, looked like maybe she was going to do what she did against Hadad Maya, save the set, you know, stop, um, stop her opponent from serving out the set, maybe clinch the second on a knife edge. That doesn't happen. Um, Shviontek is, um, gets broken back straight away. Mukova just about serves it out in, at 6 5. I think it did go to juice, if I remember right. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, it ended up being a, um, a bit of an elevator. But yeah, I, I mean, I, my recollection is I think both players got nervous a little bit, I think. And it, and it was just Mukova was just slightly more clutch at the end of that second set. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess like when I meant to balance out, it's just like it feels like, um, I guess like that's not the word that I was looking for, but it's just like I think that it, it looks like um, order was restored a little bit more, uh, even though uh, Shantek, I think she ended up getting going down a break twice in the third set. But, yeah. um, you know, it, it, it definitely was it, it definitely was the ego rose to the challenge, specifically in the in that third set. I think that on serve specifically, as you mentioned, like she got broken twice in that in that moment. I think she wasn't really having it in, in that regard. I feel like uh, Mukova serve saved her quite a lot. Um, if I remember correctly, she also hit a few uh, clutch aces like here and there, like some big yeah. serves. Um, and, you know, in a sense, I don't really like saying that, but it was bound to go down a little bit, like uh, at some point, like the level. So um, I think that's kind of like when uh, Iga, you know, just uh, showed a lot of her patience um, in, as a champion and just kind of like kept going at it and just kept like not really giving up. And just you know, waiting for the moment where she can come come back to it. And to be fair, like I feel like Mukova kind of, we, even though she's not a Grand Slam champion um, or hasn't really won that many big titles or anything, but um, I feel like she kind of felt in place in that match. You know, uh, she is a player that if you follow tennis for a while and you know her, like um, you know her game and what she's capable of, you know that she's uh, she's a great player. And you know that she should be ranked a whole lot higher, uh, especially in that tournament. Um, but you know, even for first time Grand Slam finalists, um, you do feel like um, Mukova kind of rose to to what we think of she should be. You know what I mean? Like it's not like um, I was watching that and I was like, okay, like this is a level that I know Mukova is capable of playing. There's a level of mental fortitude that I know she's she's able of bringing up as well. Uh, it may be a matter of you know it could have happened maybe in the third set that just the experience kind of got Triantek through. But yeah, we'll get to it in a bit, right? The third set. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We well, may as well get to the third set now. But I I do I do agree with you, and uh, you know let's stay on that point. Like Mukova is a player that us hardcore tennis fans have hyped up. For mm -hmm. a very long time. I mean, I remember her kind of bursting onto the scene. I think she got to a Wimbledon quarterfinal in 2021, I want to say. No, twenty. I think before that, 2019. I it must think. have been. Yeah, 2019. Yeah. And that's where I first saw her. And I was like, oh, cool. And I think that was a Wimbledon debut as well. Mm. Um, so I think, you know, those of us who followed tennis for a while... Um, she, uh, we knew no, what she was, and and yeah, I think this is the match where Mukova showed us what she she has. You're quite right, and um, yeah, it's, it feels odd to think about it as I I kind of hope that this is not her her greatest moment, as it were. Um, obviously, her career is injury plagued, um, but she, I I would really I I'd really really hope that we don't kind of see her as that plucky person who got to one slam final made a good show of it yeah yeah i agree i think that you'd be a shame because as i said also i love just watching her play so i feel like she brings up uh, she brings a lot to the table um i think she brings in like uh, uh, her style her shots her shot selection even i think she can trouble basically anybody on any surface um she i think she beat Barty. Uh, in 2021, 
Australia. In, uh, yeah. in Australia, yeah. yeah so yeah, sure. like there's a, it's a, and then she she pushes um she pushes Biontech uh, to to a third set a final set in uh, Roland Garros. So like you know she's kind of like a really good um a really good all, all court play uh, all court style and I think she can beat and if she if if she can't beat anyone at least she believes it strongly and I think I believe that she can beat anyone as well. <laughs> so I I fully believe that. I mean she's beaten Sabalenka twice this year, um, yeah. who was the form player of 2023 for most of it and um, mm -hmm. at least in majors uh so so yeah absolutely so um i mean we're going out live so we can say this like um we've just seen the news that she's not going to play in brisbane in the opening week of 2023 that's slightly concerning for me mm -hmm. um if that's uh if that's the situation because um that's a sign that she's not fully healthy and she hasn't been since the us open uh, where well, she made another good, really, really good showing, actually, semi-finals, losing to Goff in three, I think. Um, um, she she was looking really, really good in New York. So, mm -hmm. um, I would like, I would hope that this isn't going to have a too too big an impact. But at least the early part of the season doesn't have too many points to worry about. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, but back to June twenty twenty three and uh, Paris, and yeah. Mukova definitely has the momentum going into the third set and um, the confidence boost. And she goes out there and gets the early break. And you think, and at that point, I was thinking, oh my word, is this happening? Is this because as good as we've been talking about Mukova, this is Iga Sviantek on clay at Roland Garros in a final. This is not like, surely, surely not. Like I was thinking, surely not from a set and a break up. That's going to be a hard loss to take if if True. this doesn't go her way. And well, as we've been saying, she didn't go away. She kept her in. She got a break back. Looked good. Went down a break again. And Mukova was 4-3 up with a break, two points away on her serve from going 5-3 up. Uh, and I think that from and that ended up being the biggest turning point um, in the set. But I guess I've kind of done a massive narrative jump there and a bit of a monologue. But uh, do you, I guess, is that how how do you see that sort of first half of the third set playing out up to that sort of critical moment um, and what was making the difference? Uh, I honestly think that, um, I think as I said, like maybe I've jumped the gun a little bit, but I do think that... Uh, um, Shiontek believed that she would have found uh, a, a moment, and she did, as you said. Like she, but I think that what what Shiontek had to do, and she kept doing, is like one of the, a, a lot of the greats do, is that um, you know kept kept going at every single game. Uh, if Mukova had, had had that break like later in the set, maybe it would have been a bit more like dramatic. But I think earlier in the set, I think when the greats play and they they play well. And they play those matches. I think they kind of know. Okay, I, I have like what, like another five chances of breaking this. So she kept holding her serve, kept holding her nerve, kept kept her level um, at a consistent level um, to keep playing against Mukova. And who knows? Maybe uh, she's going to find like a better game on return, or maybe Mukova is going to be tight, or maybe Mukova's level is going to drop because she's going to miss a couple first serves. Um, and I think that kind of ended up happening a little bit. I think that when I was watching her, uh, Mukova, it was in a sense like a feeling that I got, like um, not to make too many comparisons with the ATP either, but like um, of like late Federer in the sense that like you know that his game is really good, but you also know that he's prone to like making errors here and there, which has ended up like happening. I think that for Mukova, it's like that thing is that. Um, is she going to keep hitting that flat a shot all the time and, and making it? She's going to keep going through the net and hitting those insane volleys that she's been doing? Or is she, is she going to pick like two bad moments to go to the net? Or she's going to hit two slices that are going to like, you know, fly a little too too high. And then, you know, Shantak is going to be able to get there. So I feel like just in terms of like, as I was watching it, I didn't, I never had a sense that like Mukova was the favorite to win that match even as a at a breakup i i thought i thought mukova is in a good position 
but she needs to keep it up <laughs> because you know I don't I didn't think that Shion Tech was going to just like lay you know like lifeless and just wait until the defeat is going to come. So I thought like at every game that she was serving, I was like, can she hold now? And she was doing for a little bit, and then it and then she didn't, and I was like, oh, now I think this match is turned around. <laughs> yeah, this is yeah. I think that four three game when Iga broke back um, to make it four all. Iga was playing fearless tennis. It was back mm -hmm. against the wall, going for it. And it wasn't like she hadn't been going for it before, but something was clicking now mm -hmm. for Shiontek. And as you say, she's a great player. So, of course, it was going to start clicking at some point. She couldn't. She wasn't going to be misfi continuously misfiring. And, you know, we ended up seeing that again a little bit um, at Wimbledon for a couple of tight matches that she had there. Mm -hmm. Um she, we saw that with, um, uh, the, yeah, uh, other uh, other events like coming against Sabalenka again in Madrid, um, and uh, I guess I guess what happened was, yeah, um, I think you're right. There was an element of was Mukova's level unsustainable, but I do genuinely think Sviontek made one big push mm. in the middle of that set to turn it around, to turn that momentum. Um, mm. And uh, yeah, I think that was I think that was a key moment. Having said that, Eager was indestructible. She went love thirty down the very next game at four all. Mukova could have broken, yeah, um, in the very next game, and it could have been an absolute nail biting, chaotic finish. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I do, I do think that like it, it was close. I'm not saying that this like the match just kept turning around as if like one player is like really good and one player is playing really bad. I'm just saying that I'm, I'm thinking that in the sense that like there are moments I never really thought that Shriantek was that far behind, you know, like, as you say, like, and even, even score wise, but like when Mukova was playing at her best and then she got the break, I, I never really thought that like um, it was all lost for Iga and then like uh, Mukova was always going to get there. I always like thought like, well, um, not not in the same level as you expect Nadal to win, but I was thinking like, well, it's Iga on clay. I'm, pretty sure she's 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 gonna make that push and i think that you you excited right like she she definitely rose to it and like kept pouncing and just got that that crucial break and i think that that moment like i, I think i remember now like you're saying like she was down lap 30 there were a few miss hits i believe from uh, mukova uh, that she couldn't get the break but i'm but uh, but but she like, fought hard to not let that, that break go you know go away again i think she she learned even within the match uh how to how to hold that serve at that moment because she she got broken a few times and could have been very similar to what happened in the in the second set um but i think that you know huge props you get for like uh, just switching that around and just um you know keeping it together and not letting the letting history repeat itself <laughs> so soon so i think that it's it's obviously like credit enormous credit to Iga to you know um hold that serve at that moment and i think that um even even then, I think that that whole observe was obviously crucial in hindsight because at that moment she was up for like five four and then she broke to win the match. But um, it it definitely was the last the last thing that needed to fall in place. I think for Iga to kind of like have that confidence back that like okay now I am in the driver's seat again and I'm not gonna let this slip. <laughs> yeah, and that was absolutely critical for. Yeah. Uh, Shviontek, and I think at that point, as you were saying, like Mukova was miss hitting, mm -hmm. and yeah, maybe at that point she she stopped being able to sustain it. Um, yeah. she was definitely faltering by that last game, and it was really unfortunate that the match was decided by a double fault. Really, yeah. Um, a, kind of a bit of anticlimax, to be honest. Um, mm. but maybe given the kind of the direction it was going, it maybe wasn't a huge surprise. Um, mm. So, um, but yeah, and then we see other scenes of E kind of crouching down. Just, it was an interesting celebration because it was, it wasn't like, it, it's interesting. Sviontek doesn't have a standard celebration when she wins slam finals um mm -hmm. they've all been very different like the first one she uh she was very much covered her mouth in disbelief like she couldn't believe what she just did 
when she won in 2020. Um, 2022, Roland Garros was um, she was just a roar of utter celebration of just um, mm. yeah, there was a, there was a an elation to it of that unstoppableness being really uh, at that point in the year, um, like that's what it had built to. Um, U.S. Open was um, just uh, uh, yeah, really uh, work was kind of a, a moment of her collapsing as she gets over the line, and when Anjou was coming back at her and making it close, and yeah, this one was just utter relief that she did it. Yeah. <laughs> I think. Yeah, exactly. I feel like I feel the same. I feel like yeah, it's. And that's why, like, one of the reasons why I say, like, it, it may have changed a bit the course of how the year went for her, because, like, just based on that celebration, it's just, like, after such a huge amount of pressure that uh, media and fans uh, or and even, like, commentators are, are putting on her um, after such a, just a ridiculous 2022, like, really, um, she comes back and, like, okay, I haven't won a single one of the the major tournaments because Stuttgart is, is a 500. It's, yeah. it's a packed 500, but it's the 500. And she, so and she, she also won yeah. another 500 in uh, Doha. Yeah, exactly. So she, she won these two, but she didn't defend any of the big trophies. And she was kind of, yeah, as we, as we were saying, like behind in terms of being player of the year, even behind like um, Sabalenka, maybe even Rybakina at that point, because, you know, who knows? what was going to happen so like i feel like for her like winning that tournament is is a relief of that pressure that she has especially to perform on clay and i think after that is like all game right so like there's no more like huge clay events like uh, in the in, for the end of the season she's never going to be the, the super favorite anymore so i think there's a lot of that uh, relief that was like you know pushed back to her uh off of her shoulders and yeah, this, that celebration I think just indicates that moment. Just like it's over, and I'm I'm the winner. <laughs> so like, and I've proved them all wrong in a sense. Yeah, I think if she had lost, it would have increased pressure on the rest of the year. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not entirely sure if it would have gone very differently to how it did, um, yeah. because um, I think you know, Eager was under a little bit of pressure anyway um, to try and fend off Sabalenka. Um, I think the end of year surge still would have happened. Um, mm. but maybe the the narrative of the year would have been not so great a 2023 for Eager, not in a good year up until the very end, and she might be coming in 2024. Now, because she won Roland Garros, it's very much that's the reason she's still number one. That's why she's the reason she mm -hmm. got number one back. Um, I think like the a big chunk of those points are gonna come from there and now really the the points are a lot more spread out through the year for her like it's a it's she doesn't have this packed chunk yeah. that she got like q2 of 2022 um to worry about like you know she's she's got she she's free to have she's a bit more free to have ups and downs through the season um but yeah i think this kind of solidified her um her status i mean like we've referred to her a couple of times as a as an all-time great um, I think you know, my personal opinion is if you win three slams, you're an all-time great. Um, mm -hmm. Three on one event, um, you're a, one of the greats on that surface. Um, mm -hmm. Even I, I, And I think even if she doesn't win another one, you know, if something goes horribly wrong with her career at such a young age, which I hope it doesn't, um, I think that's going to, I think that kind of cements her status a little bit. Um I mean, here's a question. Given her record and given that, um, uh, let's face it, her only two Roland Garros losses have been to Halep on her first attempt in 2019. Um, and that was probably due to lack of experience. And Sakharin in 21, which was due to fatigue. Mm -hmm. Is there a possibility that she could build that Nadal-like aura? Ugh. I think year over year she kind of has has that like every with every passing year it gets different. I think 
it's just so hard to put like anybody like anywhere near Nadal. We have we, we even talk about this like in terms of Djokovic having ten uh, Australian Opens and still not being close to Nadal. Like he's he's I would say he's second, but it's not close to being that they are that Nadal has at Roland Garros. But I think that in terms of like the present, I think she's she's definitely in a place where Nadal maybe was when he was like on his third year, third, fourth of Roland Garros. But she I think in 07, 08. Yeah, I think she maybe is on that moment of Rafa Nadal's career, but not quite on, on 22 Rafa Nadal's career title, like in terms of like the 14, 13 Roland Garros. That's that's something that. I don't even wish uh, for anybody to be comparing her to this because that's such a huge pressure. Uh, and she's already compared to Nadal enough, <laughs> to be yeah. honest. For but... obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. For obvious reasons. And yeah, yeah, you've got a point, I think. But then, you know, Nadal in 07, 08 did have that who could beat him aura True. because he had yeah. Federer and Federer couldn't yeah. stop him. Iga doesn't have that. I mean, in many ways, yeah. actually, I think overall career wise, she's like, she's got comparison points to Federer and the Dahl because mm -hmm. she's the, the Dahl in terms of the clay aura, but she's got Federer aesthetic of just being that bit ahead of most of the pack. Mm -hmm. um, and it's taking something special to bring them down, but we're waiting for that person to step up. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, she's kind of got it like anytime she plays Sabalenka, it's awesome to watch. Um, Goff is starting to, reel her in a bit Rebecca has been a thorn on her side for this last year um she does have those rivals but um i guess it's not quite the same sort of status mm -hmm. as we're seeing as maybe we had in women's tennis in sort of the even up to the early 2000s mm -hmm. yeah i think if we were gonna draw any comparison with the an aura of a player i think it would have been maybe maybe a venus williams at wimbledon i think he was a, is probably a more fair comparison or serena because you know they were not unbeatable uh in a sense but they were very good <laughs> you know yeah, that, that's their surface in a sense that's they, grass. they are the fate they yeah. were the favorites at every wimbledon yeah yeah exactly and even if and they had to play like their super tough matches like uh, the first one that comes to mind is that ridiculous one that um uh, Serena had to play against Elena Dementieva and she had, she had to save a uh, match point. I think the match like went at like an 8 6 or 9 7 in the, in the third set. Yeah. 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 yeah it's back in 08, point. I believe. So I don't know. Uh, 09 semi final. 09, yeah. Because then Serena went on to beat Venus in the in the final. Yeah. Um, one of the few times she did actually manage to beat Venus at Wimbledon. Mm -hmm. um, I think the only time she beat Venus at Wimbledon. No, 2002. I think, but I think Venus had the edge in the overall. Yeah, yeah. Um, at least for a while. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think that's a good comparison. Yeah, sort of mm -hmm. not unbeatable, but the the overwhelming favorite and will probably be somewhere near the final at some point. Yeah. I think for the for from about 2000 to 2019, which is like 20 years of tennis, I think only a handful of Wimbledon finals didn't involve a Williams sister. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, the difference is, is that Sviantec is one woman. <laughs> she doesn't have, true, yeah. have a sister to back her up. <laughs> she, she can't have just like her, the name Sviantec appearing just with another another initial first. Mm. Yeah. And so, but like we're talking about her having this and uh, obviously next year is going to be interesting for Sviantec because she's going for Roland Garros number four mm. and the Olympics. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's... That's an exciting prospect. I actually think um, she really, really wants both. And I don't think if she just won those two titles, I think she would have, I think she would call that a good year. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that's what she wants. That's like, if you can get anything else, but you got those two, that's dream. That's the dream. Yeah. I think that just the Olympics are such a huge pressure to a player, just like winning, winning that one title. It just basically sets you up for like, oh, mate, okay, now I can think about something else in my life because it's, I, I highly doubt that anybody thinks of any, any top player thinks of anything other than the Olympics in the Olympic year, like, especially as you get closer. That is obviously like trying to like focus on the Grand Slams and whatnot, but it, it can never really leave one's head that 
it's only once every four years. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, this one is going to be once. The last one was in 2021 because of the pandemic, but still, <laughs> the next one is going to be in four years. And Katrina points out something that I was going to, which I think for Sviantec, there is an emotional element. I mean, she broke down crying when she lost in the 21 yeah. Olympics, but yeah, her dad came fourth in the rowing in the 1988 Olympics. So he was just short of Olympic medal. Um, <sighs> Yeah, well, it wasn't just him. It was a team worth effort. It was, um, uh, I don't know if you know anything about rowing. Um, it was the quadruple skulls. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think they were, ooh, yeah, they were less than a second behind the bronze medal. That's rough. That's really rough. <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah, that's t that was a close finish. Um, and obviously, yeah, one of a team of four. But yeah, I think it would mean a lot to her to get a medal. For sure. Uh, what round did she lose last time again? Uh, second round, I think. Yeah, eh? she didn't. She didn't go too far. I th I'm pretty sure it was the second round. Um, uh, that was a crazy Olympics, anyway, with the heat and the humidity. Yeah. And 2021 was a really weird year, anyway. Um, yeah, totally. Because uh, obviously that was the Olympics. Benchich won, beating Von Drusheva in the final. Um, uh, but yeah, okay, well, that is the Roland Garros 2023 final. Um, any last thoughts on this match, Andre? Uh, I don't know. I think that watch out for Mukova next year. <laughs> I think I'm hoping so bad okay. that she's going to be healthy. Healthy. So if she is, I think she, she's going to be trouble <laughs> for most players. Oh, she will be, for sure. Yeah. Um, I, I'm definitely with you on that. I think, uh, look, she was super dangerous at the US Open as well. She gets healthy. Um, I don't have high hopes for her for Australia, but if yeah. she can build fitness back up, watch out for her at the other slam. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and that will be uh, really, really exciting. Yeah. Watch out for Mukova. Definitely watch out for Shvion Tech. Yeah. Um, right. Uh, Andre. Um, Obviously, I know you're currently taking your break. You're having an off season, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, where can we where can we find you uh, on social media? Um, and uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about the Tennis and Bagels podcast, which I'm sure people who follow us probably know about already? Yeah. Well, yeah, you can follow us at, at Tennis and Bagels um, on Twitter. I'm pretty sure it's like at Tennis and Bagels official because at some point we had like a fake account really bad problem with that but um, they, they gone? i'm pretty sure they're gone um so i haven't seen anything about it so yeah so tennis and bagels official um we follow i'm pretty sure i follow the talking tennis if i don't that's a horrible mistake and i will uh, <laughs> fix it right away as soon as this calls over it but yeah so and for me it's like at rollenberg andre and i do that with um probably familiar faces on tennis twitter for you if you if you're on that platform which is um vansh and owen owens at tennis nation and Vansh is at vansh btk uh they're both at like over five thousand followers Vansh is like over at 10 that, right now so yeah those th they're the real stars <laughs> the, of that the podcast but yeah obviously vansh a big star of uh talking tennis and uh yeah anyone watching if you have a, a, yeah take andre's advice if you're not following talking tennis on um on Twitter uh, or Instagram, then yeah, after this, go go give us a follow and give us a subscribe on YouTube if you're not uh, um, already doing that uh, and on Twitch. Uh, Andre, thank you so much for joining. Thanks for really, having really me. Good to chat through this match, this series, um, and join us again the next couple of days as we will be going through um, obviously the, the rest of the ATP matches of the year and the rest of the WTA match of the year. I will be on the next episode. I'm not going to spoil what match it is. Could probably work out the top two uh, from what's left. But overall, thanks, Andre, for coming on. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Take care and keep talking tennis. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you hit that like button. Don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell so you don't miss out on all things tennis.